All right. Good evening, everyone. Glad to have you here today uh, for our midweek service. Uh, just as a reminder, next week, guys, we will start back coming together live and in person, which I believe is the 30th of September on our Wednesday services. So we'll be coming back together at 11 a.m. and we'll be coming back together at 6 p.m. Uh, for our Wednesday services, unless something drastic changes with our current restrictions. As of right now, uh, we can continue meeting, meeting in the church. We're not having a problem doing that. And I don't suspect anything should change, but we're hoping and praying that it doesn't. So guys, let's be in our place next week, 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. for our midweek Bible studies as we come back together twice in the week, uh, in the middle of the week, for our Wednesday services in person. So I want to reiterate in person. Also, guys, we do have to wear our mask while we're here. And uh, so those who are preaching or speaking uh, does not have to wear one. I'll put mine on as I uh, move away from the pulpit today and Preston takes over for his lesson. But you've seen we have some of these uh, Saren Chapel masks. Uh, guys, if you're interested in one of those, please let Preston know. His, uh, his neighbor actually makes these, and uh, I bought a handful of them uh, for my family and you know just, just maybe some other people who wanted them. And uh, so, uh, but anyway, if you would like, like to, to have one of these uh, Saren Chapel Independent Baptist Church masks, and that way people can see where you go to church when you're wearing your mask. And there you go. It's a good conversation piece. Amen. Uh, that way someone can see it and say, yep, follow me to Saren Chapel and we'll give them a mask. Amen. So anyway, good to have good, good to be here tonight and uh, looking forward to this evening, uh, looking forward to this evening's prayer. And uh, so um, I'm just going to actually go ahead and turn it over to Preston, to be honest with you, and uh, let him go ahead and start teaching today. And uh, I'll have him open us in prayer and uh, looking forward to being back in church on Sunday as well. And uh, so here we go. Go ahead, brother. Now I'm on. BJ, make sure I'm on, that sh showing I'm on there. All right. I almost forgot to turn my microphone on. I'm sure you heard silence there for a moment, but I was saying uh, we'll be in 2 Kings chapter number 5, 2 Kings chapter number 5, uh, but we're going to go to the Lord in prayer uh, before we get started today. Lord, thank you for allowing us to be here, uh, being able to record this service. Lord, I thank you for the technology. I thank you for the opportunity. Lord, I want to ask that you will uh, just bless the reading of your word here in a moment. Bless me and use me. God, I don't have any special ability. I don't have any knowledge, Lord, unless you give it to me. And I do ask that you'll use me for a little while. And as we look at this uh, text once again, that we'll be a help to people. Don't want to hurt people. want to be a help. And I pray that you'll just do that and, and just help me, Lord, through the day. I uh, pray that you'll touch Brother Stagner, his family, all the people here at Saren Chapel Independent Baptist Church, all the churches, Lord, around our country, around the world, be with them, be with the men of God today, and use them in a mighty way. And Lord, I ask that you'll touch those that are sick, so many that's been uh, afflicted lately. We've got family, we've got friends that are dealing with different things, cancer, and different, different ailments, and I pray that you'll be with them, you'll help them. Lord, those that are traveling, uh, Daisy traveling, Lord, I pray that you'll be with her. I ask God that you'll uh, uh, just... Bless our church, bless us, use us, and open doors, God, uh, for us to do what you would have us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. 2 Kings chapter number 5. Let me get this little recorder started. 2 Kings 5. We're just going to read a few verses today. I think last time I read almost the whole chapter, uh, but we're just going to read down a few verses and then try to give you a little recap and dive right in. I'm not going to be long. We're just going to hit one uh, one little attribute here today from this text, and then we'll, we'll pick up next time with, with some more. Verse number one, now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would 
recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus, said the maid that is in the land of Israel. We'll just stop there reading. Uh, as I said, we read uh, almost the whole chapter last time, but we'll, we'll look on deeper as, as we go. But last time we introduced these events that take place in this chapter, talked about Naaman, who he was, and uh, discussed the disease of leprosy that he had contracted and kind of took a little time to look at the symptoms of leprosy and how they can really easily be compared to the effects of sin spiritually upon people's lives. And we talked about those things. And then we looked at the text in Luke 4, 27, where Jesus said, And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elias the prophet, and none of them were clean, none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. And we looked at that verse and how that there was a lot of people, according to Christ, there was a lot of people during this time in history that had leprosy, and only one was cleansed, and that was Naaman. And as we read over the text in 2 Kings, and we, we talked just a little bit about it last week, and we'll see more as we go through this study, uh, we saw why the outcome in Naaman's life was different from the rest, and it was because of this little maid that lived in his house. Um, she served in his house, and she made the difference in his life. And from there, we begin to dive into her life, and and we uh, and I uh, was talking to my my wife. I've preached this text several times over the years. One of my favorite texts, favorite ladies, as the Lord showed me several things about her over time. And I looked back through my notes, and I didn't have down that I'd preached this text here. But for some reason in my mind, I do think that I've at least mentioned it at some point. Mentioned this young maid, and and most of the time when I've ever mentioned her, or looked at her, we focus on what she did, and we will look at that a little later. But as I've been led back to this, this young lady, um, I want to look really at what guided her, what, uh, what uh, motivated her, I guess you could say, to take these actions. I want to look more at her character. Uh, and so last time we looked at uh, a trait she had of dedication, how she was a slave, forced to leave all she had known in her land of Israel, yet she had dedicated herself to serve where she was. Despite the situation, uh, she decided just to be dedicated to service and how we need to be dedicated to God first, to God's word, and to our church. We talked about those things. And as we continue on looking at this woman, again, uh, there's, only, there, there's only one statement given by her in God's word, one little statement. And it is in verse number 2, it says, And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And we'll read over that uh, many times here in the next uh, couple weeks, but oftentimes as we look at God's word, we read verses very quickly. And if you read over that verse very quickly, uh, it'd be really easy just to overlook her. One statement, what, what does she have to do with anything? be easy to overlook her, but oh, what I believe the Lord can show us through this one sentence given by a little slave girl, there's a reason God put her statement in his word. And I think we can see a lot about who she is and who we should be. So today, let's just dive right in. We talked about her being dedicated. And I think one of the reasons she was dedicated is she was also directed. She was directed. Let me explain what I mean by that. Again, we don't know her age. We don't know a lot about her. Uh, we don't really know about her family and, and who she came from. All we know is the fact that she lived in Israel because she was taken from there. That's all we really know. But it appears somewhere at some point in her life that she had learned about God. She had been taught some truths about the Lord. And how do we know that? Look at her statement once again, and we'll be looking again at this many times. Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. She knew about God's man and how God worked through him. I don't think this is just some story that she heard. Uh, I believe that she trusted in what her statement. Look at the way it's, it, it's she, there's an exclamation point there saying, hey, this is a powerful statement. This is something I know, something I mean. She says it with authority. This was not a, a guess or a suggestion from this little maid. She trusted in what she was saying because at some point she had learned about the goodness and the power of God and God's, how God used his men. So where did this faith come from? I believe it's safe to say that she didn't get it at Naaman's house. She didn't get it in Syria. The people of Syria were known more to worship false, false gods. They were against Israel. They were against God's people. 
Also, no one else there was talking about God's prophet Elisha. They didn't seem to know about him. They didn't seem to have any, any faith or trust in the Lord. So somewhere at some time in this little lady's life, she had been taught or told about the goodness of God. And it stuck with her. That's what I want to look at for just a minute, how it, it stuck with her. She didn't, she didn't leave it in Israel. So she may now be a servant in the house of the captain of the host of the Syrian army, but she had held on to her belief in God. It did not fade away. She had not let her situation that she was in cause her to waver. She still trusted God as she was a free person in Israel and as she was a slave in Syria. She held on to those truths and she applied them in her life. She did not let them go. Her faith is what directed her. Her belief in God is what directed her to be the woman that she was. And no doubt it's what made her situation more able to bear. Because she had trusted in God. It was what directed her to be the person she was. And last week we said that we need to be dedicated to God, dedicated to His Word, dedicated to the church that the Lord has put us in. And if we're truly dedicated, you know what? We'll be like this little girl and we'll be directed by God. If we're dedicated to Him, we'll allow our faith to be what directs our life. But are we de directed by our faith? How much of our faith do we really hold on to? Inside the walls of the church, and I say this all the time, it's really easy to talk about what we believe and, 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 to, and to live according to God's word inside these walls. But once we leave, how much do we really apply in our life? How much do we hold on to? Do we let circumstances rob us of what we have in the Lord? One little hiccup can come, and so often we let it disrupt our whole life. The smallest inconvenience, not, not a problem, just an inconvenience, often leads us to lose all hope. We think the end of the world has came because we are inconvenienced as individuals. And you may say, well, that sounds silly. That, that, that's not the way we are. But, and it, you're right, it does sound silly, and it is silly for us to behave that way, but think back in your life and see if it's not true. Just this year, 2020, I'm sure that we've all let these little, and, and I understand there's a big problem going on in the world, but we've been inconvenienced, but, We've still been able to live. We've still been able to have everything that we need. And we've let these inconveniences cause us to lose hope because we haven't held on to, to, to our faith. And it seems to be our human nature to do these things, to waver and lose hope when the smallest thing comes into our ordinary life. But is that really how weak us as Christians are? That should not be our traits as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We let things happen. <coughs> Excuse me. We let things that happen in life cause us to grow weary in our faith, and our focus gets away from God, and it gets upon little situations, little things, and we ply our trust to ourselves and to our environment. We begin to trust in what we think is going to happen, what we think we can do, or what the things around us can can benefit us to come out of things. We trust in everything else. And this young girl, she seemed to be anchored in her faith in God despite her situation. None of us have ever been taken from our home and placed into slavery. She was. She had a real inconvenience, a real problem, yet she stayed anchored in her faith. And I was thinking last night, uh, I had got all my notes together, and I began to think about my daughter. And she carries a, an innocence about her. She's young. Uh, and if you were around her, you'd see that she has a strong, unwavering faith. She got to spend as much time with her as I do. She was saved back on, let me get this date right, August 10th of 2014. She put her faith in Christ. I remember the day she got saved, and she was so under conviction. She had tears coming down her face, and she said, Daddy, I need to get saved. And, man, that thrilled my heart. I don't have time to spend on that. I'd like to. It, it thrilled my heart that my, my daughter trusted in God that day, trusted in Jesus Christ and what he'd done for her. And still today, she has a great trust in God, far above, above most people that I know. You see it in her life and, and in her words, in her actions, that she trusts in God. She trusts in her faith. She uh, always talks about the people we need to pray for and uh, the people that need to be saved. She's concerned. She herself, consciously herself, thinks about how she looks and how she acts because she knows the truths of God's word, and she knows she needs to be different. I've not had to push that upon her. It's happened within herself. You know why? Because of her faith. And she has convictions, and she holds on to them, and I believe it's because she remembers what God did for her 
And she wants to be what he wants her to be. And it directs her life. She may struggle with academics, Brother BJ, but she holds on to the truths that God gives her through her faith in him. She holds on to that. And I say all that, I'm not, not putting my daughter up on a pedestal, but I, the reason I, I, I say that is because she's young. This was a little maid. This was a young lady. And we don't know her age, but from, from the text, we, we see that she was a young lady. And I don't have any data to share on this, but I'll say just from my experience and in seeing people's lives, it seems that a young person that truly gets born again holds on to their faith much more than us older people do. And I don't understand really why. Maybe it's their innocence and God saves them at that early age and, and they, they take more trust in what he says. I don't know. But it seems like us that have faced more life, faced more situation and know that God's been there and saw God provide and saw the goodness of God and we've been through some things with the Lord because he's always provided in every situation in our life, it seems that it should be easier for us to be anchored in our faith. But for some reason, we forget. Some reason, instead of letting the fact that God has showed up every time before be our director, we often allow the burdens and the situations to become what directs us. And I don't, I don't know if that's making any sense, but it seems to be that we should be more directed, but it seems to be that young people that... They have more faith. They have more trust. I sent out this verse this week. Psalms 28, 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song will I praise him. David, in this, this chapter, he's calling out upon God at the beginning of the psalm. He's troubled, and he needs the Lord. He, he's calling out to him. Then he begins to show him reverence and to praise him, to talk about who he is and what he's done and, and, you know, we know who God is. Us that are saved, we know who God is. We know his power. We've saw it. We've witnessed it. We know his love. We see it every day in our lives. We see his compassion for us. We see his mercy. We see his promises. And we know all these things. And I'll say we simply need to remember and apply them. We need to get them in my, our mind, in our heart, and know these. We know them, but it's like they do not take a, a precedence, precedence in, our, in our life and in our thoughts. We need to take his word as truth at all times, in all situations, and it'll make us be joy-filled when there seems to be no joy inside. It'll, he gives us strength. He is our protection. We trusted him to save us, and I often say this, the hardest thing that he's ever done in my life was save me. And I trusted him to save me, to pull me out of hell and give me a home in heaven, to wipe away all my sin. I trusted him for that. And surely I can count on him for all the things in my life. If he can save me, he can do anything. But so often we forget. Instead of getting derailed by life and growing weary, why don't we let ourselves be directed in life by knowing who he is and, and that he's there? Then it'll allow us to praise him instead of sitting around in self-pity. This girl had a terrible situation in life, but she made the best of it because she was directed. We need to believe that he'll do his part at his time. But we also need to have faith that is anchored in trusting in what he says, trusting in who he is. And when we do that, we'll have no problem trusting him to move in our lives. And that's what this girl had, it directed her life. She, as far as I know, she didn't have any text to read. She didn't have what we have to sit down and read day in and day out. She didn't have that. But she believed in what she had been taught about God. And you can see that again in her statement. We've read it already. But you and I, we have the completed word of God, the inspired word of God. It's all here, by the way. Nothing's been omitted. Nothing's been added. And we can lean upon his word to direct us. Psalms 119 we're going to read the whole chapter. I'm just kidding. We'll start in 103. How sweet are thy words unto my taste? Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I have sworn and I will perform it and that I will keep thy righteous judgments. The psalmist begins to tell us how beneficial God's words are to him. 
He describes him as being sweeter than honey. He tells us that it gives him understanding. He says it's a lamp unto my feet. It guides him. It directs him like we're talking about. And we have, again, God's completed word in our King James Bible. His commands are there. What we are to do and what we are not to do are there. We have the warnings of what to stay away from. We have the teaching of His way. We have examples of people after person after person, examples of those that served Him and counted upon Him and what He did in their life. And we can, we can look at those examples and, and know how to adapt our life. The Bible gives us everything we need to abstain from sin, to find peace, to go through life. It is the guide for us, and we should make it authority in our lives. God's word should be what directs us. We have to get away from picking and choosing, though, of what, what we trust in, of what we put our faith in when it comes to God's word. You don't pick and choose out of the scripture of what is good for you and what's not good for you. That's not being directed. It can't be our director if we treat it that way. In verse 106 of Psalm 119, the psalm says that, that he has sworn to perform it, that he will keep the righteous judgments. You know what he's saying? Lord, I'm going to do what you say. God, you, I'm going to follow you because you're righteous. Every judgment you have, everything you say is just, and I'm going to do what you say. That's what he's saying. And we need to take God for his word and for what it said and let it direct us. It's all or nothing. If we really want to be right with God and have a directed life by him, it's all or nothing. Faith in God and his truth is not taking what you want and leaving out what you don't want. And can I, I don't have time to deal with this, but so many Christians, that's what they do. I'm no doubt guilty of it myself at times. But that's the way we see God's word. Well, that don't really apply to me. Yes, it does. If you're a born-again Christian, it applies to you. Either it's all fact or it's all fiction. There's no in-between. And by the way, can I say this? God's word is true whether you believe it whether I believe it or not, whether I practice it or not, it is still the truth. It is to be our direction. If God says something's sin, you know what? It's sin. If you still do it and you say it's okay because everybody else does it, you're wrong. God's word says it's sin, it's sin. If he says to go and do something, you know what? Can I tell you, we should go and do it. it should, if he gives us a command, then we are commanded to do it. If he says to flee from something, you know what you're supposed to do? Flee from it. If he says he shall do something, and you know what he's going to do? He shall do it. And you say, well, that's, that's elementary things. Yes, but it's things that we forget because we're not being directed by his word. It's things we need to remember. This little maid, she was directed not by her feelings, not by her situation. If she was directed by how she felt, directed by what situation she was in, this would have never took place. But she was directed by her faith, her belief in God. And at this moment in her life, at least in this moment, she was alone in her faith. The house she worked in, they didn't trust God. But that didn't bother her. It didn't matter what everybody else around her was doing. She placed her faith in God without wavering because of where she, she did not, I'm sorry, because of where she was and who she was around. She, she still allowed God to direct her despite what everybody else was doing. She trusted in God's power so that she didn't suggest that Naaman would get healing. But look at what she said. For he would recover him of his leprosy. She was the only one speaking out for God. She was the only one giving hope. But it didn't matter. She spoke it with firmness she, that he would do this. And she was able to serve in that house after being taken captive. And she served dedicated because she was directed by her faith in God. I have so much more I could say about her being directed and how we can apply it in our lives. But I'll leave you with, with something here because I said I would not be long. It's been heavy on my heart lately. She had no one to lean on in her faith but God. And I'm not talking just about trusting him to do something. I'm talking about her belief in God. And I think about the men of God. We were talking about this a little earlier. Talked about it several times lately. I think about the men of God I grew up hearing as a young, young boy. And I watched them over the years. Their hair went from dark to gray. And just in the, I mean, it seems like every day I'm hearing of one that's passing away. 
These men that were totally sold out to God, they were directed by God. Their faith, their belief, everything was about him. Just like this little maid was directed by her faith. They didn't waver. I know some men that didn't waver. It didn't matter who questioned them. They stood firm upon their faith. They didn't compromise. They didn't change just because every other or every other person was changing, just because society was changing. They did not change. And I'm not, I'm not talking about the changes they needed to make, but I'm talking about they did not waver and change upon God's work. They stayed true. I just heard my old pastor, who's meant a lot in my life, a man that he, he actually performed our wedding ceremony. And he's, he is one of those that's still hanging on, and he's directed by his faith. But I just heard yesterday that he has cancer, and it appears to be very bad. He's an older gentleman now. And again, these men are passing on, and it worries me as to what they're leaving behind. Not, and what I mean by that, not what their legacy is leaving behind, but the kind of Christians that they're leaving behind to pick up the mantle and go on after they're gone. Is there men of God that are truly directed by the Lord to take up where these men left off? Is there Christians uh, still left to take over after these people that have been directed by God? But you think about, about not, not just about these men, but about their wives. These, these godly ladies that, were, that are directed by the Lord, sold out to God. And Are there some godly ladies waiting in the wings to take over? And I'm speaking of myself. Am I directed enough? It convicts me, am, am I allowing God's word and, and my, just my trust in him to direct me? What are they leaving behind? Something to think about. We need to, we need to get back to allowing God's word and just our faith in him to be our director. I'm going to leave you with this verse. We've quoted it ever so often over the last, uh, well, what we're in September, over the last nine months at least. Proverbs chapter number 3, starting in verse number 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. It shall be help to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. We need faith that God will move in our time of need, no doubt. But we also just need to anchor in our faith and believe in God and his word that directs every part of our lives like this little maid had. Trust in him and not ourselves. It's so easy to look at this world, to look at situations with this human mind, and we want to see how we can fix it or how we can make it through or the decisions we need to make when we just need to allow God to direct us in everything. Trust in him and not ourselves. Acknowledge him in everything, and he'll give us direction. How often, and I, I may have said this before, but how often when we go to make a decision over, the, over things that we think we have control of, do we stop and consult God first? So many things that I've made mistakes on, so many purchases I've even made, uh, that God could have kept me away from the trouble that it was going to bring had I just stopped for a minute and let him direct me. So we need to reverence him and see and set us separating between us and the things of this world once again. And if we apply this verse to our lives, we can be directed. It'll strengthen us mentally, physically, and spiritually. It's, it's help to our navel. It's marrow to our bones. You don't know what, a lot of people think this is just a spiritual thing, but when you allow God to direct you, it'll influence every part of your life. There's nothing more that Satan could want for us than for us to waver. He can't get us. We're saved already. But man, oh, how he likes to see us fall off the direction of God. And today, it's so easy to let society be our director. It's so easy to let self be our director. And I can't help but think this little girl was not directed by self, especially in these statements she made. God was directing. We just need to get directed by the right source. If we get fully connected to him, he'll direct our minds, our feelings, our desires, our past. And we'll be in a state where we won't waver. And we'll trust him in everything and every way. He's so good to us. So good. And we just need to let him direct us. Know what he could do with us as individuals if he was our director. Think about this. You think about sports teams and uh, and 
I know that there's, a, there's something to be said about the talent of the individuals that are playing on the field. But there's a lot to be said about their leader, their coach. And you can get one man in to lead a group of people, and they may lose every game. And you can take that same group and get the right director in there, and they can come out a champion team. Same thing in our lives. We need, as individuals, God can do great things with you if you just let him direct you. Quit trying to make everything on your own. Quit trying to adapt to the situation. Just let him direct you. And man, what great things can be, can be done in our lives, just like happened in this maid job. Next week, we'll, we'll go a little farther. Let us be directed by the Lord. Lord, I want to thank you for allowing us to be here today, and I pray that you'll just take your word and help us to apply it in our lives. Lord, be with us. We mentioned before those that are sick, those that are going through things, just everyone, Lord, that, that has needs in their life. God, I pray that they'll look to you. Lord, I ask that you'll just bless the people tonight as they watch the service. I pray that you'll just give them the help that they need. And I ask God that you'll be with those here at the church. And I pray that you'll just help us to stay faithful unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Well, what a wonderful blessing that was. I hope and pray that you uh, you got what you needed out of that lesson. No doubt in my mind that you uh, should have. And I'm going to leave this hanging right here. Amen. And uh, so nonetheless, guys, thank you for being with us tonight. Please do remember many of the prayer requests that have gone out uh, across the uh, the uh, the WhatsApp group, the prayer request group. And uh, so if you have any requests out there that you uh, need at the current time, do ask you to please uh, send them our way. And uh, we'll not only be praying uh, as, a, as just an individual body, uh, but collectively we'll be praying as well. Uh, reminder, guys, let's come together this Sunday. Let's be in our place this Sunday morning at 11 a.m. right here at Sarant. Looking forward to being together one with another. And then next Wednesday, 11 a.m. and 6 p.m., going back to two services, and we're going back to services in person here in the sanctuary. So we look forward to being together one with another. Hope and pray that you have a wonderful rest of your week. We look forward to seeing you on Sunday. God bless you all.